you so much, Al Monk. Chancellor Reed, members of the Board of Trustees, other honored guests, members of the faculty, parents and friends of the graduating class, and above all, the prospective graduates themselves, the members of the class of 1997. Thank you. <laughs> first things first. May I be the first to offer heartfelt congratulations to all of you who receive your degrees on this festive occasion. You are about to receive your reward for your earlier labors. And as the ancient formula puts it, to join the ranks of educated men and women. For you, it is a major milestone, but only a milestone, for no one should regard graduation as the end of a journey. From this institution, you will proceed along your many paths to, to your life's work. And may I take a moment also to offer congratulations to those others who also pass a milestone on a path that has been arduous both financially and psychologically. I refer, of course, to your parents, who as of today need no longer bear the burden of your college bills. On this occasion, as we look out toward the Great Smoky Mountains, that splendid landmark of the state, we are reminded that North Carolina, sandwiched between Virginia and South Carolina, was historically described as a valley of humility between two mountains of conceit. <laughs> more recently, that condition has been more appropriately put by the novelist Pearl Buck, who observed the people of North Carolina have not the aristocratic complacency of their northern neighbor nor the careless self-satisfaction of their southern neighbor. They are progressive, industrious, and ambitious. By forging your way through the college years and by your presence here today, you have demonstrated that industriousness that Mrs. Buck discerned. Keep it up. Your path has taken you through the liberal arts, far too neglected in this country. Rather than some advanced vocational training, your studies have focused on what it means to be a man or a woman and on the lessons of history. You have gathered an understanding of human capacity, and now you yourselves, each in your own way, are entering into history. But history is not something that you simply learn about things done by the ancient Romans, or by the revolutionaries of France, or of Russia, or by the founding fathers, or our leaders of the wartime and Cold War periods, history is now something that you and your generation will increasingly shape. George Santayana, in a famous phrase, suggested that those who cannot recall the past are condemned to repeat it. Rather more pessimistically, some 2,000 years earlier, Cicero had stated, the only thing we learn from history is that we learn nothing from history. But you in this generation are obliged to be attentive to history and to its milestones. The Cold War, with its challenges and its glories, is now behind us, even though some, out of a mistaken nostalgia, might wish to revive it. But we have passed that watershed. The evil empire is gone. The international scene is no longer dominated by an apparent struggle between good and evil, or between black and white. The events and the players on the international scene are far more ambiguous today. Rather than black and white, we observe different shades of gray. As the international scene becomes more complicated, 
we must deal with it with greater subtlety as your education has informed you. What is required is a knowledge of history and its complexities and its ironies. And that knowledge of history is not just of the past, but requires an understanding of the present and an anticipation of the future. This poses a special challenge, and the American people are not especially good at dealing with complexities. They instinctively seek a situation more clear-cut, as in the Cold War, in which one could readily distinguish between those who wore the black hats and those who wore the white hats. Yet today, the United States is indisputably the world's leading power. If our leadership is to be effective, we must consequently avoid recourse to appealing simplicities. That is your challenge, and that is your task. That path will not be easy, driven by television images, or influenced even by our own public relations firms hired by other players on the international scene, we are too inclined as a society to make impulsive decisions and far too ready to follow a path started in error. To temper those snap judgments and impulsive decisions represents perhaps the principal challenge for this generation. As citizens of the world's leading power, you must all bear in mind one clear lesson of history. When a single power rises to dominance, other states tend to band together to cut the leader down to size. Already we see the rudiments of such a development. China and Russia are historic foes. Nonetheless, Li Peng, the Chinese Prime Minister, last year visited Moscow. A communique was issued indicating the need for common action to control hegemonistic tendencies on the world scene. And just last week, the newly anointed Chinese paramount leader, Jiang Zemin, also visited Mr. Yeltsin. No Russian leader is likely to be more friendly to the United States than Mr. Yeltsin. Yet even he observed at a news conference, somebody is longing for a single polar world. He wants to decide things himself. Need I add that both references were pointed at our country, the United States. Both Russia and China have been reaching out to Iran, and indeed to Iraq and to others. Moreover, even our European allies have banded together and appealed to the World Trade Organization to restrict what they regard as the extraterritorial reach of American law. That point of view is also shared by Canada and our Latin American associates. From all this, we should derive one conclusion. It is essential, if we wish to continue to lead, to avoid antagonizing other nations. The inclination to band together to cut the leader down to size is, of course, a variable. But that process inevitably will be speeded up if the leader fails to refrain from alienating other nations. There are impediments both constitutional and temperamental to the American society serving as international leader. The founding fathers did not envision a nation absorbed by foreign policy. Our constitution is unique in creating a government which enshrines the separation of powers. This means we require a national consensus before we can create or sustain a major foreign policy. Temperamentally, we are inclined not so much to ignore as to be unaware of history. Americans, moreover, prefer to deal with those simple blacks and whites rather than to delve 
into the complexities of historical grievances. A democracy, as Alexis de Tocqueville suggested a century and a half ago, is severely handicapped in foreign policy because it can only, de only with great difficulty regulate the details of an important undertaking, persevere in a fixed design, and work out its execution in spite of serious obstacles. It cannot combine its measures with secrecy and await their consequences with patience. These historical impediments have grown in recent years. With the end of the Cold War, the public's interest in foreign policy has shrunk. In the recent election, only 2% of the American people felt that foreign policy was the most important issue. By contrast, in 1984, some 30% of the public considered foreign policy most important. With the disappearance of the Soviet threat, the public's attention has faded. It has left the field open to domestic interest groups that have their own special axes to grind. Thus, domestic constituencies, mostly but not entirely ethnic groups, acquire an excessive influence over our foreign policy. As a direct result, our foreign policy lacks coherence. Instead of reflecting a hammered out vision of the national interest, it consists simply of the stapling together of the objectives of these individual constituencies. That tendency has in recent years been reinforced by the weakening, if not the disappearance, of the traditional concept of America as a melting pot. That results in a loss of the sense of common purpose on which we must depend to establish any national consensus. The new fashion of what is called raising ethnic consciousness legitimizes disunity and delegitimizes the search for a common purpose. In the past, those who pushed a strictly ethnic agenda were kind of sheepish or defensive. There was lots of explanation and even a touch of apology. But now, demands on, on behalf of particular ethnic agendas have been legitimized. On behalf of domestic constituency groups, too many politicians demand legislation. Ethnicity has become the norm. To speak of the overall national interest in the abstract is simply to invite a rebuke. In terms of foreign policy and sustaining American leadership, it is hard to find the upside of multiculturalism. As stated earlier, the unavoidable outcome in a foreign is a foreign policy stapling together the demands of domestic constituencies. All this might be acceptable if we were not the world's leader. But it is incumbent on a leader to be attentive to the attitudes and the interests of those whom it wishes to have or to retain as followers. It is neither right nor just for a leader that wishes to retain the loyalty of its followers, to demand that those followers toe the mark on issues in conflict with their own interests. And particularly is this the case if the leader's foreign policy is seen to be simply the result of a conjuries of domestic pressures. Under such circumstances, to insist either querulously or self-righteously, that others follow our prescriptions inevitably means a loss of credibility. Over time, that would mean fewer and fewer will follow, willingly follow us. Those are the conditions of the new world scene. 
though far less dangerous to the United States than was the period of the Cold War, these conditions are in a sense far more difficult to deal with. It will require subtlety and persistence, and above all, an understanding of the complexities of history. It is a tough assignment. I wish you luck. Now, let me partially turn away from these international concerns. It is customary on occasions such as this to offer a few homilies. Let me start with Heraclitus, who no doubt is familiar to all of you who have passed through the liberal arts. But for any of you who may need a little help, Heraclitus was a Greek philosopher who some 2,500 years ago suggested that harmony and truth were to be found in the tensions, tension of opposites. Paul Nitze, one of the great figures of the Cold War, has written a book on this tension of opposites. He has suggested that we apply the advice of Heraclitus to those two characteristics, humility and pride. As you all know, pride taken alone is the deadliest of the seven deadly sins. But pride, pride when te pre tempered by humility, is essential. Only with humility, Nitzha suggests, can men and women gain wisdom and a true sense of the relationship with God and with mankind. But only with a due sense of pride in oneself and in one's country can one act with courage and effectiveness. Pride may come more readily to Americans than does humility. I cite a trenchant paragraph in a Time essay by Charles Krauthammer. Quote, a standardized math test was given to 13-year-olds in six countries last year. Koreans did the best. Americans did the worst, coming in behind Korea, Spain, Britain, Ireland, and Canada. Now the bad news. Besides being shown triangles and equations, the kids were shown the statement, I am good at mathematics. Koreans came in last in this category. Only 23% answered yes. Americans were number one with an impressive 68% in agreement. <laughs> Humility is hard to sustain for citizens of the most powerful country in the world, particularly given the new priority in education on building self-esteem, all too frequently serving as a substitute for more serious academic fare. But a proper humility is indispensable if the United States is effectively to play its appointed role in the world. We shall need to delve more deeply into the history of other societies and into other cultures so different from our own. We shall need also to be keenly aware of the attitudes and interests of those nations that we seek to lead and must be appropriately restrained in demanding that our own impulses be served. The human being has the capacity for greatness and for creativity, but to attain these goals, he must put aside parochialism, small-mindedness, and an indifference to larger dimensions, including the spiritual dimension. Otherwise, as an 18th century philosopher put it, he may possibly make a thriving earthworm, but he will be a sorry citizen and a sorry patriot. Finally, as you go out into that larger world, let me dwell for a moment on character and on reputation. Ultimately, it is character that really counts. Character is destiny. Reputation is only what you seem to be but character is what you really are. You live in an age 
due to mass communications and to what may be the superficiality of impression that appearances have come to count ever more heavily. Appearances or reputation may satisfy many ambitions, save one that is critical, to live the good life. As you go your separate ways, always bear in mind that the motto of the state of North Carolina, esse quam videri, to be rather than to seem. It is a proper standard to which to repair as you and your fellow citizens strive to achieve your own and the nation's goals and thereby do your share in the making of history. Ladies and gentlemen, let me close by thanking all of you here at this institution in this glorious setting for the honor that you are doing me this day and to add once again my heartiest congratulations to all of you who today receive your degree and to your parents, your families, and your friends. May you all have productive and happy lives. Good luck and Godspeed.